But let's start here. I think I ended with God warns before he brings judgment. Not willing, it says that any should perish. Because that's not his goal. He's a loving God. His mercy endures forever. But he is a holy God. Much of what the Torah portion covers in Deuteronomy 27, 28 is echoed in the book of Leviticus. And so I'm going to focus now on the book of Leviticus and take a look. It's basically a repeat with some few things different from Deuteronomy. But if we remember, this is, uh, I had mentioned this a little bit uh, last week. This is Leviticus 25, 3 through 5, where he says, Six years you'll sow your field. Six years you'll prune your vineyard, gather in the fruit. But in the seventh year will be a Sabbath of rest to the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard, that which goes of its own accord of your harvest you're not to reap, neither gather the grapes of your vine and dress, for it is the year of rest to the land. How many of you know the seventh year follows the sixth year? Okay, good. We're all on the same page. <clears throat> now let's go to Deuteronomy 15, 1 and 2. Again, at the end of every seven years, you're to make a release. This is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lends ought to his neighbor shall release it. Let it go. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. And the end of every seven years is on Rosh Hashanah. Right? Rosh Hashanah is the end of every year. And it's the end of the sixth year. It's the end of the seventh year is Rosh Hashanah. The very word Shemitah basically is what's translated as release. In other words, the, the core word of Shemitah is Shemat. It's the S-H-M-T sound or the Shin Mem Tav. And that word means to let go. That word also is translated to shake. And I remember the Bible says everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The Shemitah year is a year of shaking. The very root word of Shemitah means to shake or to fall. When was it the Dow fell in 2001? In a Shemitah year. 9-11, the towers fell in a Shemitah year. That's when everything falls. 2008, the Dow fell in a Shemitah year. We need to be mentally prepared this next year. We're going to see the world shaking. Even the Bible prophesies the world's going to reel to and fro. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. That includes our faith. That includes physical things, spiritual things. So we need to mentally prepare. We're about to begin a year that is completely different than the rest of the six years. Let's look at Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 12. Moses commanded them saying, at the end of every seven years, which is on Rosh Hashanah, in the solemnity of the year of release, which is the Shemitah year, okay, two weeks later, which is now really into the first year, because it's just after the end of the seven years, it's two weeks later, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all of Israel comes to appear before the Lord. See, all of Israel did not have to come and appear before the Lord on the Feast of Tabernacles during those six years. It's only in the Shemitah year, at the end of it, on the Feast of Tabernacles, when everyone had to come. Kitavo, when you come. Everyone has to come in the first year of the new cycle on the Feast of Tabernacles, which is two weeks after the end of the Shemitah year. They're to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose, which is Jerusalem. And you shall read this law or Torah before all of Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, the men, the women, the children, even the stranger that's in your gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. Can you imagine? Next year, on the Feast of Tabernacles, is the end of the seventh year Shemitah, when all of Israel will be coming together to hear the Torah read by the king of Israel. That's history 15, the seventh month. Let's go back to Leviticus 25, 8 through 10. What else? How many of you know that seven times seven is 49? Every seventh Shemitah of the seven-week cycle, look what else happens. It's called the year of Jubilee. We've already seen how in the seventh year, Rosh Hashanah is significant. The Feast of Tabernacles is significant. Well, look what happens after seven sevens. We now come to Yom Kippur at the end of a Shemitah year. It says you're to number seven Sabbaths of years to you, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. 
Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. So you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And you shall howl the fiftieth year, proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof. It'll be a jubilee to you. You're, you shall return every man to his possession and you shall return every man to his family. This is why a lot of people think the Lord will return in a year of jubilee at the end of a seven seventh cycle. They haven't been able to keep the year of Jubilee for 2,700 years or so. And the reason why they haven't kept it is because you can only keep it when all the tribes are in the land of Israel. And after the Assyrian captivity, when they were taken, they couldn't keep it because every man was supposed to return to his land. So one of the first things Yeshua does is gather all the men, the women, and the children together so they can keep the year of Jubilee and they have their land back. You following me? <clears throat> so the seventh seven is all about return. Everyone re everything returns back to Israeli hands, right? So in other words, the time is coming. Jubilee of Jubilee, everything returns to its owner. Well, guess who owns the land of Israel? God. Leviticus 26, 23 through 25. <clears throat> and if you're not going to be reformed by me by these things, but you're going to continue to walk contrary to me, I will also walk contrary to you, and I'll punish you seven times more for your sins. Do you see the word seven coming over and over and over? But there's good news. Look at the good news in the Torah. Leviticus 26, 40 through 43. It says, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they've walked contrary to me, and that I've walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of the enemies, guess what? If then their uncircumcised heart be humbled and they then accept the punishment of their iniquity, then I'm going to remember my covenant with Jacob, also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I'll remember the land, and the land also will be left of them, and she'll enjoy her Sabbath while she lies desolate without them. Well, guess what Daniel does? In Daniel 9, chapter 2 through 4, he's part of that Babylonian captivity, and look what he did. Do you know he read the Torah? And he read the prophet Jeremiah, and look what he says. It says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Okay? So he, he read the book. He says, gee, there's going to be 70 years because we didn't keep it. <clears throat> and so he said, the first thing I need to do is start confessing the sins of my fathers because the Torah says if I start doing this, we'll all return and I want to go home. So, now, Daniel was not setting dates, but Daniel knew there was 70 years. And, at the, and that's, let's take a look at this. It says, I prayed to the Lord my God. Well, let me change this. It says, and I set my face to the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made my confession. And I said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. That, you know, Daniel was focused on God's calendar. Daniel knew God's calendar. He was focused on God's calendar. Okay? Well, let's take a look at something here. Let's go to the PowerPoint. How many years were they in Babylon? 70. And so what they were, were 10 Shemitah cycles. You following me? So it began the first year of a Shemitah cycle, and they were gone for 70 years or 10 Shemitah cycles. So by knowing God's calendar, he knew when the time was going to be up. Now, here's what's fascinating. In that very same chapter, Daniel 9, is one of the big prophecy things that a lot of people wonder about. Let's go down to verse 25 through 27. This angel comes to Daniel and says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, which is what Cyrus did, okay, to the Messiah, the prince, will be how long? Seven weeks. Now, these are weeks of years. So he's saying seven Shemitah cycles and two Shemitah cycles. The street will be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah is going to be cut off, but not for himself. And the people, the prince that will come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. This is what happened in 70 A.D. The end thereof will be with a flood to the end of the war. Desolations are determined and he'll confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the week, he's going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations. He'll make it desolate even until the consummation and that determination will be poured on the desolate. 
Okay, let's take a look now at the PowerPoint. Here we go. So he's telling Daniel, there's going to be seven weeks of years or seven Shemitah cycles. Then there's going to be 62. So here's the 60 more Shemitah cycles and two. Well, that's 434 years and 49 years or 62 and seven, which comes to 69 weeks or 483 years, right? And 70 times seven is 490. And it says after these here, Messiah will be cut off. And then that leaves one Shemitah week of seven years left. Does everyone follow me? Everyone that knows Bible prophecy, I think, is getting this. <clears throat> so they, you know, from this, we get the concept, there'll be a, the tribulation will be seven years. Based on one week, Genesis 41, 1 and 2. This is the story of Joseph. Remember he got thrown in prison? It says, and it came to pass at the end of two full years. Now when it says at the end of two full years, that means Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. Joseph gets pulled out of the prison on Rosh Hashanah. Okay? And let's look at what happens. It says, he stood by the river, Pharaoh stood, dreamed, he stood by the river. There came up out of the river seven well-favored cows and fat, and they fed in the meadow, and you all know the story, right? What God was telling Joseph to tell Pharaoh, there's two Shemitah cycles coming. This is the first year of the Shemitah cycle, and it's going to be a good seven years. And then the next seven years of the Shemitah cycle are going to be really bad years. And so you need to prepare these next seven years for the next bad years. But these are Shemitah cycles. You following? Okay. Now, <clears throat> economic cycles, a lot of people are wondering about the ups and downs of the economic cycle. Well, do you know, it's, it seems to be every seven years, and it's not just any seven years, it's in the Shemitah years. It just so happens it was in 2001, which is the Shemitah year, the Dow fell 7% on Rosh Hashanah the first day of the seventh month of the seventh year. And then seven years later in 2008, it was on Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the seventh month, the Dow fell 7%, 777 points, a 7% drop on a failed $700 billion bailout, resulting in a $700 billion loss. Okay, in the first month of the seventh year, you following me? It's not just it, the Shemitah, these, even nations rise and fall based on the Shemitah year. If you go back and look, this is when everything that can be shaken, nations are shaken, economies are shaken. And it's not just any seven years random. They're tied to the Shemitah cycle. Okay. Now, so, let's take a look at this next PowerPoint. Let's see if we can't get the number seven in our mind. There's a seventh day week, right? Seven day week. And the seventh day is the Shabbat. We also have a seven week time frame, which is the counting of the Omer to Shavuot or Pentecost, right? That's the 50th day. We have the seventh month with all the fall feasts, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the Feast of Tabernacles, having to do with the return of the Messiah. There's seven years in the Shemitah cycle. There's seven weeks of years leading to the Jubilee. There's the seventh millennial reign, which is the day of rest. Hebrews says there's a day coming because the day with the Lord is a thousand years. And so we have 6,000 years of man, the 7,000th year we're about to begin, which is the millennial reign. Right? Now, how many of you know the sixth day follows the fifth day. That's the kind of revelation I got from God. That's a bombshell. I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. But first, let me read a couple more verses. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 18 through 23. And do you realize the temple was destroyed right in the going from a Shemitah year to a Jubilee year? See, this is what's incredible. It's, it's all tied because remember, Zedekiah was, had made a release and then he turned him back. That was the seventh year and then comes the destruction of the temple. Now look at Zechariah 8, 18 through 23. It says, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fifth and the seventh and the 10th month will all be to the house of Judah, joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love, truth and peace. Okay, so here's what that is saying. All four of those fasts, which most Christians have no clue what they're talking about, all have to do with the destruction of the temple. Okay, tied right around to the Shemitah year, more than likely a Jubilee year. But God says these fast days that have been fast days for 2,500 years are going to turn into feast days. 
Well, if you're not on God's calendar and you don't know when those days are, you never know when the prophecy is fulfilled. And so let's look at Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 through 16. Now, you know this verse is talking about the time of trouble, the tribulation. As I read this, it's going to be so plain, you're going to go, of course. It says, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near. It hastens greatly. Now, when it says it's near several times and hastens greatly, uh, it, it means it's, it's here. Okay? And look at what it says. It says, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty men are going to cry bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And how many of you think that refers to the tribulation? Some of you don't. Okay, I do. Now, but look at this. This is what's so incredible, especially if you know Hebrew. The very next phrase. It's a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. So the day of the Lord is a day of the trumpet and alarm. In Hebrew, that is saying the word for day is yom. The word for alarm is teruah. And what do you do on yom teruah? You blow the shofar. This is telling you the tribulation begins on Rosh Hashanah some year. It's a day of blowing the trumpet and the shofar and the sounding the alarm. Now, it's known as Yom Hadin, a day of judgment. Let's look what it goes on to say in verse 17 and 18. He says, I'm going to bring distress on men that they shall walk like blind men because they sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out as dust. Their flesh is dung. Neither their silver nor gold will be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land will be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he'll make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Wow. Now, if there's any good news, the first three and a half years of the tribulation aren't supposed to be so bad. There's a false peace. You know what I'm talking about? All right. So that's the good news. The last half doesn't look too good. Now, where has the world headed since the first blood moon I wrote about on Passover of this year, 2014. A world, I believe, has now gone past the tipping point and events are now accelerating out of anyone's control. Just as ISIS has gone from the JV team to the A team, along with events spreading from Russia to the Ukraine, planes being shot out of the sky, we see everything is going exponential. Let's look at wars. You know, there's a website called warsintheworld.com, something like that. And it lists all the wars, and you can go by year, whatever year you want. You click on 2014, you ought to see all the conflicts that are going on just this year that started. But this is a website that lists all the conflicts every day. It has all the wars and conflicts in the whole world. How many of you know in the last days, the Lord said there'll be wars? Rumors of wars, okay? What is something else? Earthquakes? This is an old earthquake chart, but it shows last century, 100 years of earthquakes. Now, these are the ones that are magnitude 6 to magnitude 8. It's not all the earthquakes. This is just the big ones. Look in, from 2000 to 2008, how high it went. Now, these are worldwide earthquakes that are of 6 to 8 magnitude. The highest one you see, if you go to the left, is about 35. In other words, in about 2005, that tallest one was about 2005, there were 36 earthquakes that was either six or over. That's like three a month. Now, how many believe that looks like a lot? Well, guess what? This year, there's been 116 already, which dwarfs that. There's been 70 since the first blood moon. Interesting number. Of magnitude six or higher. Look how that has escalated. Now, I believe all of this is to say we're living during the birth pains of the coming of the Messiah. Okay, let's look at the seven-year Shemitah cycles for a minute, okay? As we know, 1988 to 1994, 1994 was the Shemitah year, 2001 was the Shemitah year, 2008, 2015. How many of you know the Shemitah cycles go in order? Okay, God is not random. He doesn't go like this. Okay, this one's going to kind of fall in here somewhere, and, and maybe this will fall here, and uh, the next one will fall there. Okay, that's not how it, he does it, is it? How many of you know eight follows seven? Okay, right. So let's look at this for a minute. 
Here was a Shemitah cycle. So you only realize this. It only comes to you when you're on God's calendar. Then comes the next Shemitah cycle. Just like there's seven days in a week, but it's one week. There's seven years in a Shemitah cycle, but it's one Shemitah cycle. Okay, then we have the next week. All right? And then we go on. But if you remember in 1994, which was the seventh year of a Shemitah cycle, this is when the comet Shoemaker-Levy pummeled Jupiter. Okay? That was a Shemitah year, a year of judgment. This event happened on the 9th of Av, a day of judgment that weekend when the temple was destroyed. The Torah portion was Devarim, which means these are my words. These are the words of the Lord. God was trying to tell everybody by hitting Jupiter on the 9th of Av in that Shemitah year that I believe when the, the 21 fragments hit, seven times three is 21. I believe God was saying the next three Shemitah cycles in the Shemitah year will be a year of judgment. And so what do we have? 2001 is strike one. The Dow fell 7%. 2008, strike two. The Dow fell 7%. Okay, this brings us to this year. Uh, 2014 is the end. We're about to begin the 2015 cycle, which could be our third strike. And then, of course, we have the next Shemitah cycle, and we have the next Shemitah cycle, right? Well, now I would like to deliver a bombshell of biblical proportions. Everyone needs to understand the prophetic time clock and the prophetic calendar of the days we are living in, which is why I wrote the book on blood moons and produced the Shemitah calendar that we have available that starts here in a week and a half on Rosh Hashanah. Now, for the most part, theologians agree that the tribulation is seven years long. What I am proposing is this. Let's take a look here. <clears throat> the tribulation, which is one week of seven years, it will not be inserted randomly in time, but the first year will begin in the first year of the Shemitah cycle. So, the tribulation is not going to fall randomly in the middle somewhere. The first year of the tribulation will be the first year of a Shemitah year. Okay? So... The tribulation could start next fall on Rosh Hashanah, which is the first year of a Shemitah cycle. If it does not, then it cannot start for another seven years. Are you getting this? I am not saying the Lord is returning next fall. I am not saying the rapture is going to take place next fall. I want to make sure you understand what I'm not saying is what I am saying. All I'm saying is this. This is the no duh. The seven-year tribulation is a seven-year cycle of a Shemitah year, and the first year of the tribulation has to begin in the first year of the Shemitah cycle because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then what comes? One. It doesn't go one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four. No. The one week left of Daniel's week is a Shemitah cycle week. So... Yeah, what I'm trying to say is, where you, regardless of where you want to put us on God's timeline, the seven-year tribulation is part of that timeline and will happen as a part of the seven-year Shemitah cycle. This is just a continuation of God's orderly time clock. So if you believe we're living in the last days, uh, I am saying we will know more definitely next year when we have the super blood moon for the first time in all of history that appears in Jerusalem in the seventh month of a biblical calendar at the end of the seventh year, kicking off the first year of the new seven-year cycle. This is not a Y2K theory based on the solar pagan calendar. It's not based on the pagan Mayan calendar. This is based on the calendar the Creator gave us to give us warnings of things to come as I presented in the book on blood moons. So here we have, these things are happening here. It, and then what's interesting is this, do you know, 1916, uh, 17, I believe was the Balfour Declaration, talking about Israel should return to the land. Seven Shemitah cycles later, seven Shemitah cycles later, takes you to 1967 when they recaptured Jerusalem. 50 years later, takes you to this 2016, 2017 of seven Shemitahs. All right, so 
the tribulation, there's a good chance it could begin. We have one year to prepare. To get mentally prepared, physically prepared, spiritually prepared. I'm not saying the tribulation is starting next year, because it could, but the thing is, if it doesn't, it can't start for seven more years. But this next year is going to be one heck of a dry run. But do you get what I'm trying to say? That it's going to be based on the Shemitah cycle. Next fall begins the next seven-year cycle.